All right, so as Jen said, I'm from New Zealand, so one of the, the things that are most obvious as I get started is usually my accent, right? It's the thing that sticks out. Um, we have an expression in New Zealand that I won't use. So I have a friend in um, Colorado where I live who said, if you could just speak with subtitles, that would be really helpful. So I guess what it's my way of saying that I'm not precious. So if any time um, through this next 40 minutes you don't understand what I'm saying, please give me a wave and I'll take another crack at it, right? So um, you know a little bit about me so far, right? i am got this weird accent. I'm from the bottom of the globe. So I'm going to tell you sort of three more things that really have led to me standing here today. <clears throat> but before I do that, I want you to do something for me. And that's to bring to mind the most important thing in your life today. What is that? It can be tangible, can be intangible, whatever you want. And this is a private exercise. You're not going to be sharing it, but what is the most important thing in your life? The thing that... Um, if you lost it, you would be devastated. You know, it would impact the quality of your life. So we're going to come back to this later, but just bring that thing to mind. <clears throat> All right, three things that are helpful to know just in terms of a bit of background as to how it is I came to be here. So I tend to say my career has been a series of disasters, right? Many of you in the room may have the same claim to fame. So I have a co-founder, Elizabeth, and between us, we have spent more than three decades supporting leading really large recovery efforts or supporting communities through disaster, um, wildfire being a subset of what it is that we've done. But one of our things that we kept seeing happening, and we've talked a lot about this today, and I cannot you know, um, emphasize, I know you know it, but just how important it is, every disaster is different, right? Every community is different. But even, and we've got to hold so tight to that, that is so critically important to a good recovery, right? But even within that, we would keep seeing these common challenges play out again and again for communities, for people supporting communities, for leaders in communities. And we're like, you know, seeing people grapple with the same challenges again and again. How can we make that just a little bit easier? So we packaged up, the last 10 years has been packaging up a lot of that learning and helping make, um, put, packaging it up into resources and workshops and tools with the aim of making it just that little bit easier for people affected by disaster or those working in it. So the first thing is my career has been a series of disasters. The second thing is I'm a cognitive scientist. So that means I'm really interested in the connection between stress and our cognitive performance. So our ability to be able to absorb information our ability to be able to make good decisions, our ability to solve problems. And after disaster, there's plenty of information to absorb, right? There are plenty of decisions to make. There's plenty of stress too, right? and there's plenty of problems to solve. So that's been a really helpful thing um, to be able to draw from. And lastly, the third piece that is most important for why I'm here today is because I am a survivor of disaster, like I know many of you in the room are. Um, my event was the Christchurch earthquakes, um, so not fire. Um, to, I wanted to take you through that event super quickly because it's not fire, so it's not as relevant today, but just to give you a sense. And there's a reason that I have these photographs up here. So the photograph on the left, so no, the photograph here in the middle is my children a couple of hours after our earthquake struck. So 2010 we had a really large magnitude 7.1 earthquake. And the magnitude is less important, even though it was huge, than how shallow it was, and it was just 20 kilometers from our house. So, you know, just in terms of the, the magnitude of it, and just some quick statistics, because I don't want to spend long on this event, but um, we had a city with a population of 350,000. Um, nine out of 10 homes damaged or destroyed. So just to give you a sense of the scale and the complexity of that recovery and the rebuild. Um, and on top of that, we had 15,000 aftershocks over the period of five years. And those aftershocks are potentially life-threatening, so constantly living in a sense of threat. And as Jen said, it was one of those aftershocks that claimed the lives of 185 people and um, injured thousands. The photograph there on the left is my six-year-old digging liquefaction. Has anyone heard of liquefaction? Got a few hands up. Yes, yeah, so it's when the ground um, jolts and shakes so violently it liquefies, it bubbles up all through, you know, parks and driveways and roads and houses, and then needs to, it dries into silt and needs to be dug every time there's a really big earthquake. But the reason I have these photographs up is because the photograph on the right, that's my kids at the time that we finished the rebuild on our home, right? We had multiple sets of repairs, as you can imagine, with the 
with um, the aftershocks. But we always say it's a long, complicated journey. And for people who are not in it or haven't experienced it, or even people who are on the journey, like it's really hard to get a sense of, and people say, why aren't you over it after two years, you know? So um, to help people get a sense of actually how long and complicated, and as Jim was saying, you know, like a tiny proportion of the effort, um, the attention and the funds goes to the, to the relief phase, which is a long and distant memory by the time we're at this point. So that's a little bit of the backstory of how I came to be here, but to me that's the most important. I think there's nothing like the lived experience of disaster recovery, especially while you're supporting a community through it. Um, so I have a lot of empathy for many of you in this room and the important roles that you play. And this session is all about that. It's about leaders and how do we support leaders with a really difficult role that you have to play. But I just want to pull out four design challenges. We said that there were some challenges that we really wanted to address for um, those to make it a little bit easier for people working in disaster recovery or people living it firsthand. The first one is how do we empower disaster affected people? And as we've heard said today, you know, after disaster, you know, the lights, the sirens disappear, the attention disappears, and it's people on the ground that are doing all the hard yards. Do you have that same expression? Hard yards? No. I'm, I'm learning as I go all the time as to um, what expressions translate. But you, you get it, right? All the hard work, the toil, the slog happens um, in communities by community members, right? So for us, how do we really make sure when we're seeing some of these similar things playing out in different places, how do we make sure it's community members that have access to that knowledge? Because knowledge is power, right? And taking that that knowledge, people will use it to lead their families through recovery, they will use it to support their neighbours, they will use it to make informed decisions in their community. And so this is, each of these design challenges, we'd look to, to create workshops or resources or things that could easily be accessible um, for communities and those working to support them. So the cards for calamity, and we're not going to spend a lot on this today, it's a whole session in itself, but that's one of the, the results that came out of this particular challenge. And I just want to give a shout out to Jim LV from Good360 because we have the cards for calamity about to head into Maui at some point, right again, um, being accessible to, to people on the ground for those who want to connect with some of the learning from others who have been through disaster. So that was the first one. The second one is how do we help agencies really aid recovery? Remember the beautiful examples from that story first thing with the phone call and the, you know, can we access your, your power meter and your, or access your gas? Um, exactly this kind of thing. But how do we help agencies aid recovery? Because it's a very fine line. You know, people never want to cause harm Right, but it's very easy to inadvertently get it wrong. So how do we equip and support agencies to get it right as much as possible? And these are the two we're gonna focus on today, number three and number four. So number three is how do we prevent bad things happening to good people working in disasters, right, and supporting in some way. So how do we support the supporters? Because you know, the impact of prolonged stress and working in this role is, is real, and we'll talk about that later. And so that's the focus of today, along with how do we make it easier for leaders who are carrying such a heavy weight, you know, in this role that you play. To us, those are really, really important. And that last one was important for three reasons. The first is it was really obvious, you know, from our time working in disasters and having been in a leadership role myself, you know, with my community, is really understanding that, and that this is Captain Obvious, as my daughter would say to me, but it's, it's that idea that leadership after disaster, especially in the long haul recovery piece, is not like leading in business as usual. It is so much harder and more complicated. And we'll unpack that a little bit more. So that was reason number one. Reason number two is we got really um, upset, I guess you could say, with seeing amazing leaders fall over. Right? And you know, you think about they carry so much for so long until it cannot happen any longer. You know, so seeing the impact of that um, was this is a really important challenge for us. How do we support leaders? And the third one being is we felt in our role in Christchurch in our leadership roles the moral obligation to do the best job possible we could for our communities. And I know other leaders feel the weight of that obligation as well. Right? Can I get some nods? Do anyone? 
yeah, I'm, I'm really be upset if I saw some shaking, so, you know, but. So those um, are very much the four challenges that we look to address and to help support with, link people with resources to help with this. So at the end of the session, there's going to be um, a QR code that takes you to a, to a handout that has a lot of these resources that are available. For us, it's about how do we make them as accessible as possible. If you're a community and you see a resource on there, we're trying to match communities with funders who can help, you know, that we can make these things available. So um, get in touch if you're on either side of that equation. All right, so let's talk about how it is that leading after disaster is different and more challenging than you know, leading in a normal environment. And leadership comes in many forms, right? So what I want you to do is I t as I go through these, I want you to tick them off on your hand and just let's see how many you get to, especially if you had a leadership role after disaster. So the first one is scale. Right? It's like when every part of people's lives have been upturned, upended, right? The scale of the challenges when it's a mass event are just, I mean, it's obvious, so much bigger. It's like going through the McDonald's drive through and ordering super size on the challenges that you have to address, on the, the vision that you need to bring, on the energy you need to find, right? The scale is huge. The second one is uncertainty. And um, I think it might have been Tatiana who talked about having to make decisions, you know, early days, but often without all the information. So it's, you know, you're constantly having to make decisions, often with imperfect information, and where even the very near future feels uncertain and it's constantly changing. Yeah? But having to act and move and make decisions in that environment. The uncertainty piece is really challenging. The third one is around time. So you think about the amount of change that happens in a neighbourhood or in a community when there's been a huge collective event, right? The amount of change, you would normally see that unfold over decades, if ever. So the amount of change that happens in a short period, it's like this time-condensed piece where there's real um, intensity around the time aspect, around competing priorities. And at the same time, it feels like a year working in recovery and supporting a community feels like dog years, right? <laughs> Some years, yeah. So there's a very weird component around the time piece. The bit that I'm naturally really interested in is the psychology. So we need to be aware of the psychology involved when we're leading in this space. So if you think about the psychology, you've got a whole lot of people who have had everything upturned in their lives. When it comes to disaster, it involves grief, and loss, and it involves disruption. So when people's lives are disrupted, it's like all those routines and the things, the fabric of your life, you know, when that's all pulled apart, and those routines normally save you time, energy, and brain space, so when you're having to renegotiate that and innovate constantly all the little ways of doing things in your life, it takes a massive amount of energy. So does supporting others around you. So does managing your own emotions through all of that. Dealing with the grief and the frustration of systems and services and everything that's happening. So quite naturally, it's an energy depletion exercise. And so what we see is very, very fatigued and tired people. You know, it's very hard to avoid. Thank you for the perfect yawn. You got me. I love it. <laughs> So perfectly illustrated, but the very tired people, you know, it's, it's natural and it's normal. Um, but that means when we have fatigue, it impacts our ability to be able to, it's our, our cognitive abilities, right? So that's where you get the brain, the fire, fire brain, we call it um, quake brain and all the, the, the brain fog. So very much it impacts people's cognitive abilities. It impacts people's ability to relate constructively to each other. So people that may be initially united can become a bit worn thin and a bit emotionally tatty in teams or in communities or in groups as different experiences play out as they go through. And it impacts people's ability to keep perspective. And so as a leader, it's understanding that it's not just about leading, so I've got a beautiful fly here, not just about leading for the physical components of rebuilding, but it's also leading understanding the impacts on people's psychology. 
when you've got a whole stressed system and stretched system and tired system as well, because it's communities, it's those working to support them through the long haul, it seems to happen on all aspects. Is that kind of making sense? And then the fifth one is the endurance piece. It's like a horrible endurance event. We set off at a cracking pace because the situation demands it of us. It's like we set off at that, that 10K run and it turned into a marathon, right? And this is often where we see those amazing leaders fall over, just that endurance, endurance piece. So people often put on hold the things that are really important in your lives um, to redirect their energy to the challenge at hand. So people will put on hold their health basics, the things they do to nurture their relationships, or the things in their life that give them colour in their life, you know, and joy. And we can do that for a little bit to redirect our energy, but when it turns into something that is longer and harder than what we anticipated, which it always is, that has some sev pretty severe impacts that we'll talk about in a minute. So in terms of these five challenges, I'd love to get a show of hands as I go through. Who, for those that have had a role after disaster, experienced none? One, two, and I promise this isn't a competition. It's just interesting to see. Three, four, five. Yeah, a lot of hands going up. And it's just, it's sobering because we know it's a really important role and we know it's a tough role. But I think it's really important to reflect sometimes. If it has felt hard along the way, it's because it genuinely is. We have not yet come across leaders in this space who have found this easy. Right. So firstly, you know, thank you for taking your part in doing um, in this leadership space for communities. It's so vitally important, but it's not an easy thing. So one of the resources that I wanted to give you to take away today that will be in the handout at the end is this companion that we talked about. So if I go back to that point around feeling that moral obligation to do the best job we possibly could for communities as a leader, we thought you know, the best way to do that is also to tap into the knowledge and insights, what mistakes do we need to avoid from other leaders who have been through similar things. We weren't the first disaster the world's ever had, and we weren't the first leaders you know, to lead in that kind of environment. So between my co-founder and I, we had two Winston Churchill fellowships, and these are combined in this resource. But it looks at, um, we spoke to over 100 recovery leaders, in various forms, because leadership takes all types, right, in all kinds of roles, and disasters across New Zealand, Australia, the US, the UK, Europe, and um, Japan. And then collated this because as a cognitive scientist, knowing we don't have a lot of brain space, we don't have a lot of energy and time, we're not gonna give you a 700-page document. So really collating this into something that's really easy to, um, to absorb over a cup of coffee and to dip in and out of. So there's going to be a, a link to this is now housed um, with the Red Cross um, in DC. So that's, that's one resource I want to give you to take away to have in your pocket, especially when times get, you hit those bumpy moments as a leader in this space. All right. And then we talked about the Winston Churchill Fellowships. So for me, if I go back to Christchurch, I was leading a team of people um, a team of workers and a team of volunteers who had a really vital role to play in, in supporting the population through that really complicated rebuild. So as a cognitive scientist, I knew we had to do something really proactive about sustaining them because they weren't working under immense pressure just for days or weeks, or even months, but for years. And so we threw the whole kit and caboodle of wellbeing solutions at this team. But the reality was we were still burning them out. So I kept thinking, again, this isn't the first disaster the world's ever had. Are others experiencing the same kind of impacts and challenges that we are? And what have they found or learned that we can apply? And again, bringing that back and then making that available to our team and then others working in other disasters elsewhere. And one of the things that became really, really clear is one of the reasons this work, and, and I say work loosely because it doesn't have to be paid work, but this role in working with communities after disaster, is the prolonged cumulative nature. So if I tell you a story, one of the first people I interviewed was from a wildfire affected community in Australia. 
and she worked for local government and I was interviewing her about two years in and I said to her, Anne, how do you kind of explain to people why you're not just over it at two years and why you just haven't moved on as a community and why it's still a thing even though the lights and sirens have moved somewhere else? And she said, well, it's kind of like this. She said, it's like carrying an increasing load of bricks. She said, before the fires, you know, my role was already quite tricky, you know. It wasn't always easy. I had internal politics. You know, we had all sorts of things. We had some challenges in a community with some historic divides and some, you know, never enough resources to do everything that we needed to do. And, you know, and then there's family logistics and, you know, financial worries. So I kind of had some bricks already, but... I'm one of those people that just finds a way, so it was okay, right? And then the fires came along, devastated her community. And she said to me, it's like every brick became three times heavier, right? Every role was so much harder, more complicated, and there were a whole lot of other bricks beside. And she said, the thing is, I thought I was going to be carrying these for a while, but I had no idea I'd still be carrying these bricks and this load, you know, a couple of years on. And if anything, the bricks just seem to keep coming. And to me, this is a really helpful way to think about why it feels so challenging over a long period of time and why it is we need to sustain and support people who have a role in supporting communities. Because we can break even the most resilient and capable of people if we load them up with too much for too long. So Anne said to me, she said, you know, the crux of it, though, was when my manager came to me and said, hey, Anne, I really hope you're looking after yourself. Like, self-care, come on, you know, so important. And Anne's like, yeah, I, th I think I know that. I know, I know, it just feels like something else that to feel guilty about and another brick to carry, right? And then, you know, in the next breath, and he's like, but I need you to do five more things urgently by the end of the week and throw five more bricks on, right? And that highlighted something that I'm, I'm going to pull out a little bit more. I mean, one, it's around how challenging it feels to prioritise yourself in this environment and the fact that self-care alone is not enough. And then the second piece that came out of our research, and I want you to think about how many of these that you resonate with or have seen playing out in people around you um, in your communities or the people that you've worked with. So in talking to people around the globe who've worked in disaster recovery environments, I asked them, what are the impacts of this, right? And these risks, this is like the downer part of today, but I paint them for a very good reason. Behind every one of these points, I can hear the painful stories that came with that. I've seen it play out in my coworkers. I've seen it play out people around me. I've been my own social experiment, right? So behind all of these, it's, you know, a lot of stories, very real people and what has happened to them in their communities and to their families and to their teams and their organisations. I want you to think about that thing that you brought to mind at the beginning of today. Is any of that kind of at risk when you see some of these things painted? And it became really obvious that it's not just about risks to um, people who are, hmm, I've missed, a, missed one. Sorry, which one did you have up before? What's that, people? Right, thank you. It's risks also to organisations, right? And it's organisations, whether it's you work for local government, whether you work um, for a philanthropic, um, basically it's that idea that it doesn't matter whether, you know, whatever role you play, but when it comes to burnout and short-term thinking or decision-making being impaired through all of this or losing perspective, that has flow-on impacts. If we think about the, the counsellor who turned up in the story that we heard this morning, it has flow-on impacts for communities. So we put out our mission and the support of communities at risk. So I know this is really sobering. It's a real downer. But the reason I point this out is because we all know that looking after ourselves and looking after people working in this space is important. Right? We understand that you know, um, philosophically, logically. We get that. But I don't think we're um, quite as clear around what is at stake. So if you had someone working up at heights on scaffolding, it doesn't take much in your mind to be able to imagine what could go wrong with that person if we don't have the right supports in place. Right? If you have a role in recovery, you are equally at risk. Right? It's one of the most challenging, important, vital, amazing roles that you'll ever play. 
but there's also some risks that we need to be very intentional about managing because a lot of these can't be easily unwound. But the good news being, I don't know if anyone else has experienced that when you have a role like this, I mean, not only is it incredibly f fulfilling and valuable, but it's an incredible learning experience. Has anyone found you've just never learned so much? Sometimes you wish you didn't have to, yeah? <laughs> but, you know, if we come out the other end and there's a whole piece around this, around growth, you know, growth in a community, growth as leaders, you know, the things that you come out with, but we have to be very intentional with our practices to tip the balance as much as we can towards growth and away from harm. And the good news is there's a lot that we can be doing to really tip things towards growth and minimising that damage. But it doesn't happen by wishing it so. There's a message I really want to give you to take away. And I'm going to go through this really quickly because I want to get into an activity with you. Remember I talked about Anne and her bricks? And, you know, the message around self-care is really important, but actually how hard that was to put in place and actually if, if we don't think about the wider picture, it's not really enough. So what came through really clearly is that supporting the supporters, supporting leaders, supporting people working in this environment with a really vital role to play is a triple responsibility. So if we start with the organisational piece, and we don't have time to go through it in the workshop today, but I just want you to know that we have things that you can plug and play, resources and support at each of these levels. But if we think about organisations, whether you are a local government organisation, whether you are a local recovery committee, whether you are a funder, you know, at this point there's a lot that we can be doing to help tip the balance towards growth and really getting in to support the supporters. So that's really important, is understanding what we need to know, what we need to do, and having the resources to be able to do it. So there's a lot that we can be doing at the organisational level. At the team level, Teams are phenomenal things. It's our peers that often get us through the hardest of times. They understand what it is we're going through. But when everybody's tired, we're not often at our best selves. right? And so teams can actually become a source of stress as much as of support. And so equipping teams with what they need to know and do and the resources and tools to be able to be great supports to each other when everyone's tired and under pressure is really critical. And then lastly, and this is the piece we're going to have a little bit of fun with, is the individual piece, right? That piece around self-care. Let's see a show of hands. Like, who here knows you should eat five fruit and veggies a day? Who here knows exercise is important? Move those bodies. Yeah. Who here knows that sleep's important? Who here finds that all really easy to do, especially in the middle of disaster or recovery? <laughs> no. So one of our design challenges was, well, okay, it's not just about educating about self-care, it's about helping bridge the gap between what we know is important to do to look after ourselves and actually being able to do it when the pressure's on. So I want to share a story that, actually I'm going to do the exercise first and then I'll share the story afterwards. But what one of the tools that we designed to help bridge this gap is the doing well and we're going to have some a play with some of the cards in a minute in an envelope um, in the table in front of you. But the idea behind the doing well was again around helping bridge the gap between knowing it and doing it when the pressure's on. It's got to feel achievable. It's got to be enjoyable. It's got to feel like it's something that is possible. Um, and it's got to be intentional. Because one of the things we find is that we always intend to look after ourselves in these roles, but it's always the thing that falls off the bottom of the list. So having an intentional plan in place and having some accountability for that, there's a, a plan template that comes with the set of cards. That means that you can have a bit of fun creating your plan, you can have someone to help keep you accountable, and it means it doesn't fall off the bottom of the list. And I just want to talk you through two of the themes in the set so that you know what you're getting in the cards in front of you. So um, there are five different themes, and each of them speaks to a challenge that we see practically play out for people with a role like people, you know, in this room in a community. The first is that we all know about social capital, right? We all know that actually it is your social connections that are one of the most vital predictors of how people do through challenge and adversity. Having those social networks 
and leaning in and using them and supporting each other is what really helps people get through tough times. And yet what it is that we see happen is when you're really tired, when you're really exhausted, you know, when your to-do list is massive, how often do we say, I just don't have time, right? That Friday night thing I used to do with my friends or that Tuesday sports thing I used to do I can't commit to anymore or I'm no longer able to hear the messages from those around me that really can see that I'm heading for a fall. So the connect cards, they are the yellow ones that you may find in your envelope. Um, uh, the idea being you pick a couple of people in your life that you really know and trust. You pick, go through the set, the cards, and you pick out a card or two that you know would be useful to you under pressure. You give them to those people and you say, please give these cards back to me when you see that I need them. And I commit to doing what is on those cards. Right? So it's a way of setting up that support crew. And I'm not going to talk you through all the themes, but just to give you an idea that there's a reason behind everything that you're, you're going to get. The fifth one, the damn good decisions, are in, again, around having to make those cognitive, um, making decisions when you've got the, the cognitive stuff going on, like all the fire brain and the impacts of stress, prolonged and cumulative stress on our, on our brain and our decision making. If you think about those photos of my kids before and after, there are a million challenges and a million decisions that had to be faced between those two sets of photos. And some of those decisions were life shaping and yet we're making them with a very tired, stressed brain. So in the set of cards, there's a set of questions people can use to check their decisions against. So just giving you a bit of a taste as to what's in those envelopes. So in a minute, what I'm, I'm gonna give you the instructions first. And then we're going to spend about five minutes doing this. So it's going to be a really quick draw activity. In the envelope on your table, you're going to find one of these. So a card for calamity. We're not going to use that right now, but it's a card that you can each take away. Use it in your networking if you want over the next few days because there's 70 cards and you're just going to get a tiny taste. Some of them are super practical. Some of them are more reflective and maybe compare your cards with each other, right, over the next few days so that you get a sense as to what else is in that pack. But the tiny little envelopes are the ones we're going to use for this exercise. So before you open them, the instructions are quite important. So here's the instructions in the set of cards, and you all know that I'm trying really hard not to say, no? Oh, yes, yes. Deck, very good. So it doesn't work well with my accent. So yeah, set of cards or pack of cards, right? So in there, you <laughs> so basically in here there's a hundred, and you're each going to get three. So there's a couple of things you know for certain, right? There are uh, basically no one else in the room with the same cards that you have in your little envelope, and chances are very, very, very low that the cards in your little envelope are the best cards for you in the room. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is just in the next five minutes get you to to basically open your cards up, check them out, and compare them with as many people as you can in the next five minutes, the aim being to get the best set of cards for you that you possibly can in the time that we have available. So you want to trade and exchange cards, but you have to say why it is you want someone's card. All right. Any questions? Let me know. <laughs> Look at everyone's faces. <laughs> All right. It always gets people's attention. I always find it hard to get people back after this activity, so I had to enlist my squeaky chicken. <laughs> All right. So feel free over the next couple of days to continue trading those cards until you get the three best for you. Right. And same with the cards for calamity. I'm happy to talk you through lots of fun ways these can be used in a community. So with the cards, you can make an intentional plan to protect well-being. I like to have everyone in a team with that plan in place. But again, cards or not, the message is around being intentional, right? Having a plan, having someone help keep you accountable, because we all know how uncomfortable and impossible it feels to prioritise self-care and the roles that we have. Like, I know I've been there. So I want to tell you a story that helped me with that before we finish up. And the story, again, came from a wonderful recovery leader in Australia. Her name's Dr. Kate Brady. 
and we interviewed her as part of our Winston Churchill Fellowship, but she was also part of my support crew through the earthquakes. And she said to me, you know, Jolie, I want to tell you a story, and quite clearly I needed to hear this at the time. She said, <laughs> you know, early in my career I went for this job interview. She was a social worker before she ended up working in emergencies. And she said it was, you know, one of my first professional jobs. I was really nervous and I had really, you know, I prepared within an inch of, a, of my life, you know, for this interview. And I was knocking it out of the park. Every question my hiring manager had for me, I had, you know, what felt like a really good answer and I was doing really well. And she said, but then she asked me a question I didn't know what to do with. And I said, well, what was that question? And she said, well, the question was, so Kate... Are you a martyr? And I have to say that carefully so you understand, martyr, <laughs> right? I'm getting it wrong. Or are you a professional? And Kate's like, I'm sorry, I don't really understand the question. And she said, well, it's really easy. I can manage you for both, but I have a clear preference. If you're a martyr, you'll be the first one here. You'll be the last one to leave. You'll, you'll say yes when you should say no. You will fit, you know, fill every gap on my roster you know, you will just be absolutely indispensable for a while. She said, you know, you will be here, you'll burn bright, but you will burn out. And it's not a whole lot of point me investing in you professionally. So what I really hope is if, you know, and I would prefer as your managers, if you are a professional. If you're a professional, you will still care deeply about the mission and what it is you are here to achieve, right? But you will put some boundaries in place. And you'll model that self-care that others around you need to see as well. And together, we're going to have a greater impact for the community that we serve over the long run than if you're a martyr. So which Kate is it? Which is it, Kate? Are you a martyr or are you a professional? Quite clearly, I needed to hear that story at the time in my leadership role after the Christchurch earthquakes, and I am a recovering martyr. I can say that quite honestly. Um, but I, I share that story with you because that is a really useful question I ask myself to help bridge that gap between knowing about self-care and finding a way to do it. And I just want to finish with this illustration from New Zealand. Uh, we did a lot, we work a lot with indigenous communities in New Zealand, the Māori. And when we talk about supporting leaders in a role in a community after disaster, they say, oh, it's like the Po. And the Po is the supporting poles in their meeting house in a Faranui. And without those poles, the Faranui can't stand. And it's those leaders that carry the weight in a community. They are those poles. And she said, but we've seen those poles fall over and what it means to a community. And so I guess my message for you is to be thinking about if you are an organisation or someone who supports recovery and those working in it, is to remember to fund and support and sustain those that have a really vital role to play because they are those PO. And if you are a recovery leader, I know myself, I know how challenging it is to prioritise yourself, but you need to. It is really, really important because there's so much riding on it in terms of it's mission critical for your community, for your team of people and group of people that you're leading, for those things that you probably brought to mind at the beginning of the session around what you cannot afford to lose. Right? It's really, really important. So I just want to leave you with that as a, as a thoughting message around the importance of it and, again, something else to have in your mind around how do we equip and support the community leaders, the leaders, people who have a leadership or vital role in, in recovery. And lastly, a, um, a QR code that links you to a whole lot of resources and supports. Um, I'm happy to talk through any of them and, again, to look at ways we can make sure that these are available and accessible to communities where they're needed. So thank you. Thanks for having me.